I think on the on the democracy point, um, two things to separate. Um, that one is about what a, what does a government do? And the American philosophy philosopher John Dewey said a government does what its citizens want it to at any point in time. And the lawyer Jiggers, the two lawyer Jiggers that were held over the last years, were just amazing to watch because Afghan citizens were standing up district after district saying this is what we want for our village. So I think you can have. I think there's enormous pull from the ground to have Afghans to have health care and education care and get their irrigation canals going in, in every district. That's different from whether you elect your leader every few years and how you deal with the point of transition of power. I argue with a number of colleagues that we shouldn't have rushed into elections so soon, that there should have been, if we look back over successful transitions over the past decades, this is what Ashraf and I write about in our book, um, there was often a period of seven to ten years of building rule of law before you moved into democracy. I think that would have been better, but we are where we are now, and those are the rules of the game that have been accepted for how power has transitioned. Um, and that was actually the agreement of the, of the Afghans at Bonn. It wasn't, wasn't a Western imposition. On the communist point, I think um, my, my driver once pointed out, he said, see that traffic policeman? He's wearing a Karzai uniform now, before he was wearing a Taliban uniform, before he was wearing a communist uniform, before he was wearing a king's uniform. So actually there was a, a Westminster-style civil service. There were 240,000 civil servants, according to the payroll records, in 2001, and they had lasted. And that's a real asset to build on. And a lot of them now are approaching retirement age because there hasn't been the investment. Um, and a lot of training did take place, though, in the communist era. They can be used. And we think there are something like 60,000 police officers and army officers who were trained during the communist time in the Najib Bullock era who would be a great asset to security right now. So, yes, I think there are some assets and some lessons there. M mentoring, I think we're all going to agree violently. Um, somebody said, look, if 80% if of the new Obama plans good, then you should be happy about that. The 20% I'm not happy about is exactly stressing sending civilians in rather than training up Afghans. And one of the other catastrophes of the last years was the failure to invest in Afghan higher education and vocational training. When we put the first Afghan budget together, the UN and the World Bank said you can invest to the Afghans zero money in anything above age 11 of education. So they said no secondary education, no tertiary education, no vocational training. So where were the doctors, lawyers, teachers, accountants, bricklayers, plumbers going to come from? So they haven't been invested in, maybe with the exception of Bamiyan University, but by and large, a tiny proportion of the money has gone into training Afghans, whereas two or three billion dollars a year has gone <coughs> to bringing foreigners into the country. And I think that is the fundamental thing that has to change as quickly as possible. Um, and particularly for Afghans to know that it's their future that's going to be invested in, and there'll be career paths where they can become stakeholders. Um, on the British Army's role, um, my, my view is actually that the British Army and the US Army have, have learned very rapidly. Um, part of it is this coin doctrine or the comprehensive approach, and often do a much, much better job than the so-called development agencies. But whether that's a good route to go down, where you have the military taking over more and more areas of civilian um, it's, it's probably that's the route that Pakistan went down. It's probably not where we want to go. So better to invest in civilian agencies. I'll just take the, the last two questions if I can remember what they were so long ago. Um, mentoring, first of all. I mean, the, the, it, you need to understand where that mentoring idea has come from, and I think it's come from our experience over the last three years with the Afghan army, which has been trained up through this thing called the OMLT. It's called the OMLT, which is the Operational Mentoring liaison team and it's the, the ANA, the Afghan National Army is, is arguably the most respected institution that's come out of our, our intervention there in the last uh, few years and, and a, lot, a lot of the training is done through this mentoring business and it works as it says on the tin, you, know, you, you have a, a unit of British soldiers or American soldiers working alongside the ANA and they've been going into attacks against the Taliban, they've been learning on the job about how to secure their country and it has been very successful. Um, so they're trying to extend that into the civilian sphere. Um, that's, that's all that they're doing, and that's the idea. I agree, there's a huge question about whether the civilians that they get will be up to scratch, and of course it's incredibly important that they do. At the moment it's only an idea on paper, um, but at, at least they're trying it. And I do think it is, a, it, it is one way of tackling corruption. If, you, if you're in an office with a, you know, yeah. whoever it is, a district judge from Iowa so sitting next to you, you're just not going to be able to take the money out of the till. <laughs> right there, that is a start, isn't it? Um, I mean, I agree that some of the people are going to be hopeless, they always are, um, and, uh, but who knows? And, and I, I just think at least they're trying something because nobody else is. 
So that's kind of what I think about mentoring. But I agree, it remains to be seen. On the army point, um, I agree that they've, the army have learned a lot about development in the last they've had to. Um, there is a sort of a cultural difference between the civilian side and the military side about development, which has not been addressed properly, I think. The civilian side, by which I mean Foreign Office and DFID and those actors, tend to take a much more long-term view of development. It's something that happens over many years, it's very slow, whereas the army, being the army, they want everything done yesterday, they want it done now, they want quips, they want quick impact projects, which is, and there is a lot of tension between the two of them. Um, a lot of the problem with the comprehensive approach as applied by the Brits in 2006 was that the army, as they saw it, had secured the area, and then they said, now it's the turn of Diffid and Foreign Office to pilot and do the development. They didn't come because it was too dangerous, there was too much fighting which is, so it just left the army having to do it themselves. And they weren't, they, they weren't, or they aren't, the British army are not really equipped for major scale long-term development, they're not. But it's changing, and we've got a new um, top general coming in, David Richards, who has lots of very interesting ideas about how to reshape the army. He wants to kind of come up with a different kind of formation. So there may in future be um, uh, battle groups that would include experts on microfinance and um, civil engineering um, people and, and all the things that you need to kind of get, uh, get development up and running, get the motor ticking, which I think is a very smart idea and I think that is the way, you know, the army of the future should be like that. I hope it is. <laughs> thank I would very much like to thank um, an incredibly informed and um, wonderful audience and uh, I, I'd very much like to thank our panel. There are, they, they will be signing books and actually they are Can, can I have your indulgence for just one question from you? I think we would, yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sorry. Can I ask you anything? No, no. And that is, first of all, uh, for uh, Miss Lockhart, I think what David Lyme said, the actual thing began with the bone. In those la la uh, warlords, where they live now, by the way, that's called the abode of wolves, Kata Gurgaon. So it has begun from there. Secondly, Ms. Uh, Seaton, uh, you try to detach the British Tony Blair from the Americans. I don't know why, because this was a joint decision taken, and I think uh, the media has done a lot of uh, harm to, uh, you know, liberating Afghanistan because they played a very negative role uh, you know, concerning Afghanistan in the Taliban is too. And third, there is a very important element in that, which is in David Lyons' book, which is 200 years of foreign engagement. In, unless that foreign engagement is addressed to, I don't think there will be any solution because that has now come in Pakistan hit from the very beginning, very big role in that when it was to the benefit of the West of Pakistan, it was acceptable to everyone, but now it is not. I, I think we'll take these issues up later. People will be around signing books. You can talk to them. Thank you very much for that. I'd very much like to thank our audience, our audience and I'd very much like to thank our panel and I recommend three books that certainly take you into, with beautifully written, into really complicated stories. Um, thank you very much indeed. <laughs> <laughs>